So we're going to start talking about connective tissue. Well, let's take it to its logical conclusion. We know that connective tissue gets hard as you age with no apparent reason other than possibly its loss of ground substance, the moisture in the connective tissue. People that do yoga or do other things like that, that are paying attention to it, somehow it gets more flexible where they're, they're not as impacted. So somehow tension seems to change the ground substance in the connective tissue, yoga. Well, now let's talk, take that to the next logical level. Our Western medicine has given all kinds of labels to us naturally aging and our connective tissue getting hard. Fibromyalgia is one of them. And they're even telling fibromyalgia patients their connective tissue getting stiff not to go get structure work. Wow, That's, that was amazing to me to hear doctors telling their clients not to go get out of their trap. Arthritis is the next logical step after that. Joints all stiff and it hurts and you're pained all over. Connective tissue getting hard. In Germany, they used to call it connective tissue dearmoring. And that's where Ida Rolf ran into an osteopath who was doing this kind of work to help her kid. It's real. And you can change the state of your connective tissue. And SI is the only way I know of that does it significantly. She, Ida Rolf used to say, I could change something in your body in five minutes. You can do all these other perturbations and stuff. But, but I'll change it in five minutes because there are real thorns and real flesh that are causing these problems. And she could almost always find them. So know that. 75% of the things you go to the doctor for are musculoskeletal. And, have, and this is the solution to it. And it should be on every strip mall, but it's not because the American Medical Association decided through insurance they weren't going to accept it. Otherwise, you'd know about it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's changing, though. And there are pockets around the world where, where it's really taken off. Okay. <laughs> the mind can only endure what the bottom can. So if, if I could just ask you a question. The promise is that by following a structural integration practice, you can help people with arthritis. Is that true? Exactly. And, and, and you, may, you may believe this is just nuts. But most of the people that are involved and have been structural integration, once you trigger this process, you, imagine you're laying down out of the gravity field and you stand up in the gravity field. There's a huge transition and you usually get massive changes once you've started this process. It's absolutely amazing. Imagine waking up every day and getting a little bit better instead of getting worse as you get older. And not, and not signing up to the idea that my connective tissue is going to get hard, that I'm going to get stiff, I'm 50 years old and I'm more flexible and more capable than most 18 year olds I come across. That's true. I, and I, I find it just astounding uh, testament to this work. <clears throat> when the energy body starts, or when the body starts aligning the gravity field, she noticed that personality was not fixed. And this is what caught me, caught my attention in the beginning of her book. You mean your relationship to gravity could affect your personality? And, she, and her analogy was, Go look at one of these crook guys who has a really messed up structure and take it to its worst next level and put him on a used car sales lot. And you walk up to somebody who's animating that kind of energy. Are you going to buy a car from that person? Generally, you don't. But somebody who's upright and acts more righteous, they're related, by the way, you're going to be more trusting of that person. And we do this almost even in our dating. We look for symmetry that we equate to beauty in our choosing of a mate. It's fundamental and primitive to us, okay? So personality is not fixed according to our role. And I found this to be true with my clients as well. When they went through this process, uh, the, the metamorphosis was almost always the same. It was interesting. And it, and it doesn't happen overnight. Usually it would take about a year for the client's first 10 series to get real significant change. The longer you wait in your life, the more work you need to do. You start out with somebody who's 17 or 18 or, or his age and do structural work with him, he'll grow into a body with no constraints. And it turns them into super athletes too. My, my son was a high school wrestler. He weighed 129 pounds. And he was more mental. I, I was really surprised he got into wrestling, but he had had structural work. And, they, and their nickname for him was Gumby Blade. <laughs> they could not ever pin him because he could always have one shoulder blade off the ground and God help you if you actually got anything in between your shoulder blades, he could go like that and practically take your hand off. 
And he was, a, he was a league champion for three years because of this work. Unbelievable what it does to you. Okay. I, I have a so is your suggestion to go in the phone book, find structural integrators, and, and Actually, in this modern era, we don't even have phone books. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if, if, if you go to rolfguild.org, there's probably a practitioner in every state that you can call up. And you know they've been trained by that organization. So that's what I'd recommend. Say that again, Rolf. Rolf Guild, R-O-L-F-G-U-I-L-D.org. Now, there's another one called the Rolf Institute. There's only two main schools in Boulder, Colorado. There's the Rolf Institute and the Guild for Structural Integration. And these people were the original people that go back with Ida Rawl. Okay. okay. Can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. I'm trying to get, I think about chiropractic medicine, right? Okay. I think about the same relationship between the American Medical Association and insurance. Right, right. And, 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 and that's changed, right? Well, if, <laughs> meaning the chiropractors are not accepted. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, what's the what's the political force here in LA that's keeping this out of mainstream? The American Medical Association. Yeah, but, but, but that's it. Yeah. If, if, if listen, I, I discovered that if people couldn't go someplace and have their insurance pay for it, they generally didn't go, especially in bad economic times. Even, I, and I had a practice in Tucson with land baron, rich kind of clients, and they started when the economy got bad. Even they were using the insurance, and it, it truly is the differentiator. If the insurance doesn't accept it, it, it's generally not in the mainstream. So, but there's also a supply problem, right? Because I know, for instance, in Northern Virginia, mm -hmm. there's only like one or two people that can do the wall thing, like for miles. Right, miles, right, right. So, but I don't, if it's right and true, and I'm not challenging mm -hmm. you, I'm, I'm, this is a statement. Right. If it's right and true, I don't get why it, it, it doesn't exist. Oh, it does exist. No, no, but not like all of us wanted to. Not readily. Oh, you know, it's been suppressed from my, from my viewpoint. I tried to mass market this work on the radio and all kinds of things. And first of all, I have to say that when you get to the point where you're dealing with changing the energy body in human, you're talking about spiritual things now. And not everybody is at the place where they're ready for that. And that was hard for me to accept. Even though everybody needs it, not everybody is allowed to get it through the, whatever the constructs of the universe are. It's very odd. For instance, I found, and most other practitioners I found, when you get to the place where you're about to put your hands on a body, you normally need to ask permission. Well, sometimes you don't get it. And it's very devastating to see that happen, and knowing they need it, but they're just not ready. And, and, and the analogy is, think about yogis, how they would choose a student and very closely watch them as they would go through this process of transformation. Well, in our culture, we don't do that. People go to yoga classes like it's exercise. They might be waking up, but nobody's there guiding them. As a matter of fact, I would tell you that because of that, in Boulder, Colorado, there's probably more psychologists working with structured clients than anywhere else in the country because when that personality thing starts changing and they're not made aware of this or educated about it, it's frightening. Right. So that's why I, I, and part of the Rolfing Charter, the Instructional Integration Charter, is education. So I never, I would never do this work with a client without letting them know what they're in for. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to, we, so we're back down to some definitions and we're going to get on to something a little better here. But awareness controlled by the activated energy levels quantized in your chakras. What, what, what are we doing on time? I think we're good. I think it's about 11.30. Okay. Oh, we've got, we got to go then. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, in the Eastern tradition, they talk about these chakras going from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And these tie to very definable physical places in your body. We talked about this one being tied to the ganglion of impar on the coccyx bone, okay? And then this one all the way to the top is referred to as the crown chakra, maps directly to the pineal gland. Pineal coming from the Latin term pine, pinus, which is like a pine cone. It looks like a pine cone, a very small one, okay? And we're, and we're gonna see how important that gland is in this energy body depiction. 
Now, the top of the energy body I didn't really talk about. There's another one that ties to your breath. Okay? And inside of your nasal concha, there's a ganglia called the sphenopalatine ganglia. And it's very important in structure work, and we always treated it importantly. <laughs> and you can, you'll find out through structure work that hardly any area of the body is off limits relative to connective tissue being changed, except for the reproductive organs of the body. We don't go there. Inside the nose and the mouth, fair game. This is the last vertebrae on your spine, and it changes just like all the other ones. Okay? So, I got another picture here that's a little more uh, illuminating on this. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing apart to me about the energy body, and actually I have a couple of tools. I didn't bring them with me, but I wanted to tell you about them. One is called resonant field imaging. And essentially it's a high gain antenna you hold in your hand, you pass it in front of these nodes within about three to five inches of the person, you read the frequency off the meter, you put it into some software, it converts it into wavelength, and then you can see the colors of, of the chakras. Pretty simple. <laughs> I didn't bring it wide because I'm missing the antenna off my meter. I don't know where it is. I've got to order another one. <laughs> so, um, and, but the thing about the, this, this red measuring the frequencies is very onerous. And I have this sheet and I have to fill in all these frequencies and then go enter them and it converts. It's a long process. What I discovered after that was a guy out of the U UK, Dr. Harry Oldfield, had, dis had discovered in digital video that you have luma, chroma red, and chroma blue, and that <clears throat> photons from a proper full spectrum light interact with the biofield of your body. And this could be captured in a chroma deviation in digital video. And he wrote some software to do this. Okay? It's called polychromtrast interference photography. And I bought this system back in 2006. Very expensive. And he wasn't giving this license to very many people in the United States. Has anybody heard of PIP, by the way? What it is, you can take a high definition camera, point it at somebody, and see their energy body without, without doing anything, without taking all the measurements and any of the software. I found that a lot more amenable to my practice. And so I, have, I was going to bring that along. Um, I've got some videos on the, on the internet that I'll share with you. Yeah. It's kind of like Kirlian, except you're not, you're not um, putting a dye or doing anything like that. You're just naturally sh capturing it on video. And because of a photon's interaction with the electromagnetic spectrum, you get a slight deviation when it comes close to the body. And that can be picked up with a camera. So what that ends up is showing you a color-coded schema around your body that kind of looks like it's uh, in layers. And as you do things, to change your consciousness like a biofeedback system, you can actually see it change real time. Then you can play games like group interaction, see how this person affects how. So we're, there's, there, I'm gonna actually publish some data on this. Now, the, I bring this up because <clears throat> to me, what I noticed was when I was working with structure clients, that their energy was changing, but it was coincident with their structure changing. And every session I was taking before and after pictures, front, back, left, and right, with a grid chart and a plumb bob. Okay? And I would share this with the clients every session so they could see how they're unwinding relating to the gravity field. And that awareness that I was providing them through this feedback turned out to be the most important part, one of the most important parts of them participating in getting out of their trap. Them being able to visualize what was going on with them and see it. And I'd send the software home with them so they could look at it and share it with their friends. It was a good marketing tool. So okay. these are good and bad pictures? Well, what did I find from my polycontrast interference photography work? What I found was there's a direct correlation in your energy body relative to your structure aligning to gravity. So there's a, there's a finite what good looks like. Right. So for instance, if you had a subluxation in a chiropractic term, one of your vertebrae is rotated, yeah. and there's some interruption in the energy that's flowing up your spine, yes. that could be seen on the polycontrast. <laughs> it would show up as red instead of the proper color that it was supposed to be. You understand what I'm saying? So you, could, yes. you had a color contrast that wasn't right, and you go. But the creator of this camera picked, obviously picked which colors show good and bad. It's right, right. The, yeah. the extent to which the eight-bit number that represents the, the luma red, or the, clo the chroma red, or the chroma blue, well, you know, it's an eight-bit number, so it could go minus 127 to 128. So he would skew that based on the amount of interaction with the photons. What? 
trigger for this? When did you when did you make the break from your old life into no. this? I'm just trying to get some foundation. Um, probably. You, said you bought that camera in 2006, right? Well, I bought the the, the software that oh. went with it. Um, I actually made my break probably 2004. <laughs> was, was when I really stopped seeing medicine as something that was helpful to me, and when I changed my diet. And it all started happening mostly internally because the energy changed. It happened naturally. It wasn't something I said, well, I've got to go do this. It just, it just was a natural occurrence for me. To start, you know, when your body starts coming apart with structure work, and it truly will at every joint, it feels natural to stretch and facilitate that. And so naturally, I was like, well, how do you do an organized stretch? I didn't know. I was an engineer. What sounded like yoga was because they had an organized stretching thing. And I approached it from that standpoint. It wasn't about the Hindu gods or any, all their belief system. They had an organized stretching routine that seemed to work. And in structure work, we generally would counsel people to get a full range of motion of some sort, whether it was Tai Chi or something that would allow you to go through a full range of motion because that's what facilitated the body coming apart and better relating to the gravity field. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. Okay, let's go faster. Um, amazing to me, the shock of wavelengths. A wavelength, the speed of light equals wavelengths times frequency. Okay, so knowing that simple relationship, you can take frequency and wavelength and relate them. And it was amazing to me to find out that the colors of your chakras match the colors of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Interesting, very interesting to me. Who created us like that? To have wavelengths that coincide with the colors of the rainbow. And also coincide with the visible spectrum from four to 700 nanometers, which we see. Very clever, whoever did that. What's the significance of the number seven? Why seven? Chakras is depicted on the caduceus. What's the caduceus? This was an ancient symbol carried by somebody. And you see it on the American Medical Station, the British, there's just the entwined serpents going around a central pole with some wings coming out and a knob on the top. What does that mean? And whose symbol was it? We're going to talk about that. But the American Medical Association and the British have adopted this symbol representing health, right? Could our shock away leaf be related naturally to occurring frequencies generated elsewhere? So, who's heard of the Schumann resonance before? Does anybody know what that is? What? Schumann resonance. Schumann, Schumann resonance. resonance. So there's a property of a spherical ball when hit with an electromagnetic spectrum, it resonates. And it'll create a standing wave of a various frequency that's strictly a function of the geometry of the ball. For our Earth hitting the electromagnetic spectrum, our standing wave frequency is about 7.8 hertz. That's the Schumann resonance. Okay? The reason that's important, that frequency falls within your brain wave region, and we're going to talk about those. Okay, so could these frequencies be generated elsewhere? Is something I want to plant the seed for you to start thinking about? Is uh, the sound of your the frequency is it like slight, slightly above C sharp? What? Seven point something. Well, it's seven point eight hertz. So it depends on which octave you're in in, in the, the musical scale. So that's a very extreme low frequency, by the way. <clears throat> so. That's what, that, and, and a short acronym for that is ELF, extreme low frequency, okay? Let's see where we are. Okay, I'm gonna put all these up here so we can do them all at once since we've gotta go fast. <clears throat> so, I'm just gonna lay this out for you. I'm not gonna go real deep into it, but there's a book called uh, Genesis of the Cosmos by Lavalier. Very interesting book where he goes into the tarot cards and talks about the archetypes from which those tarot cards came from. Does anybody know what the archetypes are? Let me just do it quick. Okay, the archetypes generally in, in that line of thinking have to do with the persona of, of, of the individual and it's related to your birth sign. Okay? So we know that there's Capricorn, Aquarius, and all the other zodiacal houses, but in that there's a persona that goes with them. And everybody reads about it in their horoscope, but it goes a lot deeper than that. There's a, an awareness in your DNA coding that's primitive, and Timothy Leary talked about this. And in his, in his theory, we all have sequences in our quote-unquote junk DNA that have to do with time sequence in our awareness and energy, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. Okay. 
How are consciousness and thoughts related? So, if we're aware that we have the ability to choose to accept a thought or not, then there's a choice. That is the ultimate freedom. It was the ultimate freedom for Viktor Frankl in, in prison, and it's the same choice you and I have today to choose our thoughts. Because thoughts turn into behavior. Okay? Their belated announcement of your of, of, of behavior is nothing more than a delayed announcement of something you've accepted in, in your thought life. So this is important. All right, let's get on to some other stuff here. I think we did that already. You don't have to learn to control your thoughts. You just have to stop letting them control you. Now, <clears throat> hopefully the thoughts you're generating internally from bi-directional social memory in your context, they're all happy. We know throughout the universal experience of mankind, that's not the case. Most of our thoughts are destructive. Are what? Destructive. And, we don't, and nobody really knows why. Why that's the case. Because we always feel that it could be. It could have to do with our relationship with our Creator, too. <clears throat> Can we be responsible for our thinking? What are the consequences? Whoops. How does it affect the concept of now? For instance, one really neat uh, thing that Krista and I do whenever things get bad, we'll stop and bring our awareness to our five senses and go, is there anything wrong now? Oh yeah, I gotta go to the desk a little while, or, or I forgot to do it. No, 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 that's later. That's in the future of the past. Is there anything wrong now? And usually the answer is no. And that exercise can bring you into a place where you realize now is where it's at. You, get, you have to go in the past and deal with things to correlate with the future, and you have to go into the future to plan. But your mind is a computer and you don't need to live in it. You use it to get your job done, then you turn it off and go be in the now. So that's the model that we like to support. <clears throat> so your thoughts are the key to that. You're going to manifest your own reality. So stinking thinking leads to a stinking life. Okay, so the power of positive thinking is not just a, you know, a, a thought, a concept. It's real. It's real things. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> this is <laughs> kind of a bold statement. The evolution of our consciousness naturally leads to frequencies where we're going to have encounters that were talked about with, these, uh, with beings that are higher than we are. Now this is where it gets, starts to get fantastic and hard to believe. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about the Anunnaki in the second session. Okay? But many of the duality symbols that we see, yin and yang, light and dark and such, we need those to understand how to evolve in, the, in this simulator that we're in. We can't know good without bad. We can't know light without dark. And you're going to find out that some of these beings that were put in, their, in, in, our, in the mode to interact with us represented those forces. And it's very hard to accept, but it's true. So watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, because they become actions. Watch your actions because they become your habits. And watch your habits because they form your character. Mm -hmm. And watch your character because it affects your destiny. So, <clears throat> a little model of fate and destiny for you, just for fun. And these Anunnaki, if you read some of their accounts, one of them struggled with the concept of fate and destiny relative to us. As a helicopter pilot, <clears throat> we used to fly low-level low terrain routes. And part of our test was to stay within 50 meters of the line that you were supposed to navigate. Okay? If you got off there, you busted your check ride, you're out. So they taught us a very valuable lesson in life, in flight school. That was when you get to a place where, you, where the map doesn't match the terrain, don't make the terrain match the map or you're going to fail your check ride there too. Go back to the place where you knew you were, where you were oriented. Okay. You came to a, cro a fork in the road, and you took one, the, the left fork, and you got lost. Well, the natural, logical thing to do is go back to the fork where you knew you were and take the other path. That's true in life, too. If you're going down to a path where your, your fate, 
your actions in your life are not matching des your destiny where you can feel it and you'll know it. This is part of your ar archetype. It's deep in your DNA. It's part of the, the hero's journey for all of us. Okay? If that's not happening for you, go back to where you knew you were. That's the lesson I got, and it truly works. Okay? It's easy to get lost in this life, in the path. Now, let's talk about brain waves real quick. We talked about extreme low frequency. The brain waves have naturally been segregated whoops, into four regions, delta, theta, alpha, and beta. It starts about a half a hertz and goes up to about 20 hertz in your brain. If you've got frequencies from the outside that are landing in that space, watch out. Because the amplitude of that signal is higher than the brain wave you're generating. Guess which one's going to win? The one with the highest amplitude. It's just an electrical principle. What do you do about it? What do you do about it? Well, you could join the UFO crowd and put a little tin hat on to guard your cranium with not letting frequencies in. Or, or potentially, you could activate your own energy body so you're not susceptible. And Dramvalo Melchizedek, in his work, mentioned a way to do that, and it's called the Merkaba meditation. And we can talk about that. Has anybody heard of the Merkaba meditation? You have. And actually, somebody who had the flower of life have you not heard of the Merkaba meditation? I've heard of the Merkaba. Okay, that was Dramvalo's main teaching, how to, us as humans to activate your energy body that exceeds, it extends out about 55 feet. Okay? So if you do that and you're having an encounter with beings, you're feeling all their energy too, and that's true. So this brainwave segmentation is very important because each segment seems to have different attributes for humans. In our waking consciousness, we're about 13 hertz. Well, actually, if you look at that, that's actually ADD, your attention deficit. If you're at 13 hertz, you're bouncing all over the place. People who are in the alpha state, around 7 to 8 hertz, are much more centered, and extreme learning can take place there. And then you go into the delta state, and you're having out-of-body experience during your REM sleep. So, so the difference in the frequency that you experience in your brain changes your reality. Very important. Well, when you're in REM sleep and your eyes are doing the rapid eye movement, it's, it's a common belief, I don't know if you accept it, that you're actually having energetic experiences out of the body in other dimensions while you're sleeping like that. And you're incapacitated in your brain so you don't act out those motions. So there's actually a chemical that's put in your body to immobilize you during REM sleep. You yeah, know it protects that? you, right? It so protects you from actually sleepwalking. People that don't have that, they actually walk out, live out their dreams, and they can get injured. So, okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about these real quick. Oh, wavelength, frequency, and the speed of light. I'm going to do this kind of quick because I know we're about to bump up against lunch. Okay. I mentioned in the polychromatic interference photography that they were relating. The, uh, light to the, the energy field of the body. Well, how does that work? A real simple model so you can understand wavelength and frequency. And they get used all the time, but if you just get the definition down, then it makes a lot more sense. Here's a simple um, waveform, a sinusoidal wave that goes from zero to two pi, a full phase of a waveform. Okay, and here are the intermediate points. There's 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270, and 360. And you can see that from this um, rectangular coordinate chart. So there's zero, no, 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 okay. And that's how polar coordinates are done relative to waveforms. So the distance from here to here is the wavelength, okay. And the number of times this, these bumps occur between T0 and T1 is the frequency. So in this case, I got two hertz, and let's say that T1 is only one second, okay. So so, so this ought to help get us to understand wavelength and frequency. Does, does anybody not understand this? Okay. What's your question? I have no idea what this means. Okay, suppose you're out in the ocean and you see the waves coming in like this. The uh, distance... I understand amplitude and wavelength and frequency. I don't understand how it relates to what we're talking about. Oh, well, th well these wavelength and frequency are going to turn out to be fundamental, measurable parameters in the human energy body. Let's see if we, we can get there quick. Okay, brain wave table, we talked about it. Delta, theta, alpha, and beta, about a half hertz to 20 hertz. Everything from deep sleep, here's your out-of-body experience and hallucinations and such, and here's your supposed alert consciousness. Actually, I, just, I think it really should be closer to here, but 
this is where it is, okay? Remember we talked about the Schumann resonance, look where it lands, in the alpha region, 7.8 hertz. When you're measuring these, these are like you're putting things on and actually physically... Yeah, this, this could be done with an EEG. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are you measuring? Brainwaves. Brainwaves. Which are? It's an electrical signal. Okay. Electrical signal in the brain. Yes. And, and your frequency or the amount of times in a second? Well, it depends on what time you want to integrate it over. If you just take it in one second and look at the number of bumps that happen in there, it's an easy way to convert it into frequency because it cycles per second. Right. So you pick it to be one second, how many bumps happen in there. What, what's a hertz? A hertz is cycles per second. Okay. So bumps per second is a hertz. Yeah. yeah. So, what, so if you had one bump in one second, it's one hertz. One cycle per second. And you're double. Huh? And then you're in the double. <laughs> right, right, right. If you had one cycle per second, you're up here. That's very rare. And you're in flight or flight in beta. Um, well, usually our waking consciousness, you'd be in fight or flight, yes. No, no, you'd be in, be yeah, in beta, <laughs> absolutely. This is where you spend your waking consciousness here. Right now. You're thinking, aware, consciousness. Okay. That's where we are. So this is what this is what a normal person looks like. And right. Now you're going to start talking about what it means to actually navigate that chart. Well, potentially, okay. yeah. Uh, I mean, imagine that you weren't always at 20 hertz; that you could somehow get yourself down to nine or 10 hertz, and in that you were much more centered. In beta. Pardon? Yeah, in beta, in, in your waking consciousness. So what I'm saying in structure work. Remember, we talked about yes. the wavelength changing. This is, this is frequency, which is related to wavelength. Okay. The speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. Well, let's get a little bit farther and you'll see that, okay? Okay. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want you, what I want you to get is the, the complexity, the interaction of the electromagnetic spectrum with matter. This is what changed everything for me. I, I knew the laws of physics, how they applied to bodies and inanimate objects and so on and so forth. I had never applied these equations to myself. That's what I started doing in Hawaii, and, I'm, and it led to some very interesting discoveries. Um, we know about, so you can look at this. The bottom line, without getting too complicated, is if energy goes into your body, and, and, it, and it's a measurable amount, and the same amount doesn't come out, you absorb some of it. So the law of conservation of energy is very important. Energy isn't created or destroyed, it only changes state. That's what E equals mc squared represents. Okay. That's, a, that's applicable to you as well. So for physis, physicists or people who don't have a religious belief, they may take this and say, well, if energy is neither created or destroyed, and I have energy in me, then something survives beyond this material. And that's their, that's their salvation doctrine, if you will. Okay. Okay. We'll talk about some external frequencies that could affect you. The high amplitude of... Can you go back one second? Okay. So what you're saying is for people who would be, what you said, non-religious, so we'll say atheists, right? Mm -hmm. So they could use this, so basically it's like a mathematical way of looking at the human soul. Essentially. Okay. Yeah. If, if energy is neither created or destroyed, it only changes state, and this, this dies, then the energy has to just change state. I just right? want to make sure that yeah. we're all speaking the same thing, right? Yeah. That's and actually that's E equals mc squared. The energy equals the mass times the speed of light. Well, the speed of light's a constant, but your mass is, it, it's a very simple equation, but profound, and maybe not completely true with our modern understanding of quantum physics. But in the, in the Newtonian model, some of it works. Well, from this capacitor point of view, that you, you with the ganglion of impar? Yeah, mm -hmm. you guys were talking about earlier. Yeah. You're saying that you can absorb energy, I mean, roughly. Right. We're understand. all being hit by all kinds of frequencies but right now. You can now. absorb energy, and there's positive and negative energy, and you can store it. It, it seems to be, yes. Well, because that's what you're saying with alignment. Well, well with the alignment, it's not so much of a storage it is as no, you no, being no. a medium through which gravity activates an energy. And I'll show this to you in just a second. Okay, so whether there's storage going on or that you're animating the energy correctly because of the frequencies that are being generated at various levels through the Earth. Right. Okay? And the Mayans believed there were nine of them based on the various... So the human resonance can be calculated based on the circumference of the Earth and the speed of light. That's all you need. Okay, so the circumference. So now go to an inner core of the Earth, and you're going to realize that the core divided by the speed of light is going to give you a different number than the one on the surface of the Earth. And they have these nine frequencies that they said 
seven of which fell into the delta theta alpha and beta region. So it's like, wow, are we supposed to be, are our chakras related to those? I and mean, we'll get to that, I think. So there are frequencies that are, we're supposed to be synced with, it well, seems. how are you and Pat relating that to spirit? Spirit is energy. And E, e is energy. Let, let's get to that. You're, 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 you're almost there, okay? And I'm going to give you the equation for the human energy body. You're going to see it's a function of gravity, wavelength, and frequency, just to kind of give you a heads up, okay? Okay. Okay. So heart, this is an instance of some external frequency that can land in that delta theta alpha or beta region and affect you. And there's been whole books written about this program. It was supposed to be a system that lets you study the ionosphere, but then you realize that reading the patent, they can do this in the extreme low, low frequency and modulate data on there and cover entire countries in a cone by bouncing it off the ionosphere. Look into this, this is very frightening. So what I'm telling you is, if a thought comes in from the outside, which is possible with this system, you gotta be aware of that. That's why you gotta take responsibility for your thoughts. That's where the battleground is. You with me? No. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I'll, if the thought's coming from the outside. I'll put it in layman's terms. I got the thought coming no, no. from the outside. No. I'll say what he's saying in layman's terms. Outside forces, please don't film this part. <laughs> <laughs> outside forces, like the government, could potentially use technology like this. Like this, that really exists. To transplant thoughts or energies into you. And what he's saying that is if you learn to practice having the right type of consciousness and thoughts, that you can block those from manipulating you like the sheeple that the government wants us to be. I got that. And it's, a, it's the way to keep the man from keeping you down. <laughs> Go back to this thing here that you're talking about, the, the field. You know, what oh, oh, heart. Okay. Well, this. I want you to make this real for me. Okay. Okay, so explain it again. Okay. They can, they can, they can target regions, square miles, or countries. You say whole country. Or, or relatively, the, the cone size that they can make with this. So they have an antenna grid here that, that produces some of the most powerful energy on the planet. And what they do is in a focus. Where is that? This is in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay. And, it's called, and you can go look at it on the internet. There's all the books about it. Uh, Sarah Palin can see this from her portrait. Who? Sarah Palin. Oh yeah. Well, she can see it's Russia. Yeah. <laughs> well, what they do with this is they they learn from uh, a radar technology how to focus this energy into a beam at a at a point in the ionosphere. And what they were doing is using it illegally as a backscatter radar spying on other countries. They didn't tell you that. Right. But they pretended it was about atmospheric research. It has nothing, very little to do. Actually, it has atmospheric uh, implications that they appear to be able to change the weather with the system. Very frightening. So. Just as a footnote. No, I was just going to say for a footnote for your book, today, right now, you're closer to the largest ELF antenna in the world than you are when you're in San Diego to the last You're talking about the one in Virginia? No, I'm talking about the one in Northern Michigan. Oh, really? Listen, every there... Sat, every, sat, every submarine around the world yeah. listens to the antenna in Michigan. Well, the reason submarines work so well with ELF is the extreme low frequency penetrates the water very well. Through the earth, actually. Yeah, yeah, extre yeah excellent. exactly. Earthquakes, when earthquakes happen, that low frequency of uh, vibration is, tr is translated through the earth as an ELF. Are you seeing this as Merkaba meditation can offset the effect of power pulse? Well, from Drumbala Melchizedek's teachings in the Flower of Life, that was the main focus of the 17 breath meditation was to activate your energy body to protect yourself. So, and I've been doing it for years, and I think it's, I think it's effective. So, it takes a lot of practice, though. And actually, on, the, on YouTube now, you can actually get the video. And it'll do it for you. You don't even have to memorize it. It'll read it to you, the whole thing, and just do it. Try it once. See if you notice it. Can you set it tomorrow? Yeah, so you have an energy body that's very, you know, you've heard of as above, so below. Well, it's true with your energy body as well. And he goes into extreme details about the different layers of it and so on and so forth. But, but how does it transmit a thought? Well, a thought, I believe, your, your brain is a computer. And it, its ability to associate the external environment 
with your state space is where thoughts come from. They're derived out of a context. Generally, context-based thinking is what happens through bidirectional associative memory. You either associate it internally and see it outside, and you see something outside and it, and it triggers something you to think. Right? So it's, it, they're oftentimes, your thoughts oftentimes come up in context with where you are. No, I can't get to the leap that you're making from them to be able to do this oh. and transmit a thought to me. Oh, okay. Is it something that I'm subliminally hearing? Well, it can be transmitted such that you can't hear it. And this is done through a process that's similar to how cats hunt. If you watch a cat hunt, it's got two ears that are singularly, or independently articulated. Well, <clears throat> they're set at a distance that causes spatial diversity, and yours are as well. Yes. So when sound arrives, there's a slight phase difference depending on if the ears are like this or like that, right? And the, there's a primitive organ in your, in your body that's able to take frequency and triangulate on the sound, okay? It's a hunting technique. And it has to do with the reticular activating system I was mentioning to that before. Okay? So the sound, so that ability is the basis of what's called sound entrainment. And they can use it for healing, if you go read about it. If you can entrain the being to accept a sound that lands within that audible range and then translates into a brainwave region, you can entrain to it. So listening to music that makes you feel good changes your brainwave frequency. Listening to a shamanic beat at four hertz per second on a drum like the indigenous folks do in some places will take you to a different brainwave state. Right? But none of those frequencies are audible. Oh, well, okay, so how do you do it inaudibly? You can do it inaudibly. Suppose I take two frequencies outside of the human range of hearing, outside of 20 kilohertz, okay? And I were to mix those, and I think I have a picture to show that. I can mix them. And when I do that through a mixer, I get the sum and the difference of those frequencies. And if the difference falls in the extreme low frequency range of your brain, guess what? You've just been a susceptible in treatment, and you can't even hear it. And that is the basis so of how like, most of it's like, done. It's like gamma knife radiation. When they put 40 different beams in your head, and none of them by itself can affect That's you. right. But when they all collect together, they can destroy tissue. That's right. That's the exact same thing you're saying. And they're doing that to us every day. Yes, they are. So they re are they lowering our frequencies? Well, they don't, they don't want us to be awake. That they are, if you, if you achieve the highest level of consciousness and, you aware, and you're aware that you've been enslaved, what are you going to do? You're going to mutiny. You're going you're to fight off the oppressor. Okay, so anything you can do, and that's the government's job, is to keep us under control so we don't mutiny, right? We outnumber the people that are governing us. And this is, goes all the way back to the Sumerian accounts that you're going to see this afternoon. So There's you, nothing different. Do you have to accept a conspiracy theorist idea to be able to get into this kind of frame of mind? No, I don't think so. So how, how about for folks that don't argue? We'll just, we'll just go down and look at the data. So here's a, a, a harp system that exists, and you can go read about how it's being used. And by inference, and Jerry, uh, Jerry Smith wrote a great book on harp, by the way. And he called it the ultimate weapon of the conspiracy. <laughs> or whatever that means. So we can do conspiracy theorists will sign it, but there's so much data out there now, you can approach it from a data standpoint and, and decide that question for yourself. So um, through spatial diversity and phase differences, you can give a human a sound that they can't hear that entrains their brain is what I'm telling you. And actually, um, Jesse Ventura did a conspiracy show on TV when I was watching TV. And he actually went to Harp and interviewed a doctor who had produced a device to demonstrate how a thought can be put in your head without you hearing it. And he did it on the TV and showed it to him. It's very, very easy to do. Like what kind of thought? What's, what's an example of it? Oh, it could be music. You can put music. Anything you can modulate onto a carrier, you can put into somebody's head. Think about a radio station. They have a carrier wave that's sending out the radio signal. Well, on that, it's modulated all the data. Well, it's no different. Okay? It's absolutely the same thing. Audible your audible range only goes. How is that a thought? Well, your audible range. Well, imagine you can modulate a thought onto the carrier, present it to the person, and train them, and all of a sudden something's coming in their head. They don't even know where it's coming from. They think it's their thought. Imagine you wanted to start a, a revolution in a country like an Arab Spring, and you wanted everybody to get animated progressively, just hitting them with a, a thought where it's affecting the mass consciousness. So you think Possibly. that was caused by something like this? I do. And actually, they can cause earthquakes with a thing like this, too. Say that again? 
extreme low frequency generate if it's bouncing off the atmosphere and you're directing it toward a unstable plate tectonic, yep. you can cause an earthquake. And there are people right now saying that what happened to Japan in that disaster was caused by heart. It does me too. I hope it's not true. That said, let's, so this picture right here shows two frequencies that were mixed together. I did this on a little spectrum analyzer that I had okay. when I was recording didgeridoos. <laughs> That's why I was so interested in didgeridoos is because they, they produce these binaural audio beats on their own. So anytime you take a, a frequency and mix two together, which is shown here, frequency one, frequency two, sum them together, you're going to get the sum and the difference of those frequencies coming out. You with me? If one of those frequencies lands in your brainwave region, you can be entrained by it. Now, you don't have to accept the sound. Say you don't like the sound that's coming in. Yeah, I don't like that. You, you won't entrain to it. But if you accept that sound and, you, and it feels good to you, or you don't even hear it, it's very possible you can entrain to it. Doesn't it have to be in separate ears, too? Like, I well, don't have to, those binaural beats that you can energize yourself or meditate yourself. That's exactly right. You need that phase diversity of your ears, just like the cat, in order for that to arrive. Your reticular activating system goes, oh, yeah. This is a primitive thing. Am I hunting? No, I'm in training. Or you don't even know. It happens automatically for you. Okay? And so here you can see also, when you mix frequencies, if they're lined up in phase, they're going to give you a, a peak that's higher. If they're not, you're going to get a depression. Okay? So having frequency, so the idea of superposition is very important as it relates to your chakras. Now think about those seven chakras that got wavelengths in them. All going out, suppose they're all going out at the same time, you're mixing them all together. Imagine they're supposed to be synchronized in a way where they add energy and not to take away. Okay, I talked about the human antenna. There's some obvious models of deviation from the gravity field. Okay, and there's and lots of other ones. Okay, this is supposedly normal. Uh, from a rolling standpoint, we take it even farther than that. Okay, but you can see the deviations head forward. Where's the ear relative to the shoulder? Like I said. <clears throat> Reticular, I'm not going to get too deep in this, I know we're getting, but inside the human brain are real mechanisms that A, we talked about the reticular activating system that controls awareness. There's also the pineal gland and other um, organs in the brain that are very affected by frequency. And know that. It's, we are an electrical being. Uh, I mentioned this uh, structure as function energy paper I wrote. And I'm, going to, whoops, and I'm going to go through this quick derivation of equation 5a so you'll see this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Okay? It's in the book as well, and it gives you all the derivations in the book. We talked about the positive pole and how it relates to that and the sphenopalatine ganglion. Okay? If you've had an impact to your nose where, where you can't breathe correctly, it's affecting your energy body. And in the yogic tradition, there's in your vertebrae, you have the spinous process that comes straight back, and then you have the two transverse processes that come out the side. Okay? Well, out the side is where your, your nerves go out from the ganglion and either sense or affect in your body. So if you've got, if you've got problems there, um, the sympathetic nervous system could lose control. We talked about the, so there's the positive and the negative pole. There's the positive pole, the negative pole. And in the yogic tradition, they actually have these separated into nadis through, your, through how your breath affects your energy body. So on the right side of the transverse process in the sympathetic nerve, they call that the ida, uh, ida nadi, and the one on the left they call the, the pingala nadi. Well, those map directly the nasal conches in your nose. So when you're breathing through your nose correctly, it actually is affecting your energy body. It's very important. So how's it happening here? Sleep apnea? Well, I think it has more to do with well, the... Well, it's symptomatic to something else, right? In those I think it has to do with the uvula, how it hangs down in your throat and blocks your airway. And, and, and it's a structural thing. And I've actually seen people, they can buy these devices that change their jaw location and it affects sleep apnea. Well, I had mine lasered out. Oh, did you? But, but I'm, let me go back to this. Well, yeah, that's exactly. Remember I talked about anything that can get in trouble that's not tethered down gets in trouble? Well, that's true of that, too. The whole roof of your mouth. But when you talk about positive and negative, mm -hmm. are you using those terms just in, in terms of 
holds po and not like good and bad? No, I'm talking about in, in, I'm talking about positive like a battery. I'm right. talking yeah, exactly. Okay. So here's I just talked about this this Pingala Nadi, this Ida Nogali. So this is a yogic model of our energy body, and I don't want to get too caught on that. You can we can take modern Western equipment and measure all this stuff. So we don't even have to use these labels if you don't want to. But there in their tradition, the central pole that goes up your spine, okay, they call that energy the sushima. Okay? And they also say that when you have out-of-body experiences, that, that connection, that civil strand that supposedly is connection to this, okay, or whatever. Okay. Uh, 